Well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, it's been, uh, I've had a, a fabulous relationship with many people here at the archive, Steve Murray, Sherry Ham uh, Hamill. And it's just been a, a, a kind of a fun thing to do to, 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 to come down and, and be able to talk to you about the, the Emancipation Proclamation in wartime Alabama. But before I begin, and now I'm going to warn you, is I know you all are here on an hour lunch break probably, and some of you may not be on a lunch break, but uh, I'm going to be reading this because I want to make sure you get back to work and you know, keep, it, uh, you know, keep our state dollars uh, flowing in the right direction. But I, I wanted to, to thank you all, and, and just before, I want to caveat something before I begin, and that is I want you to remember that this is a snapshot. This is not, by no means an encompassing look at wartime emancipation in Alabama. That this is a snapshot, a series of snapshots. And in reality, when you think about history, history, the definition of history is change over time. And so what I wanted to show you was that, that Abraham Lincoln all right, changed over time. That black slaves in Alabama changed over time. That lawmakers changed over time. And in a, in a time and an era where, where politicians don't want to compromise and don't want to change because it shows weakness, I think what you see in, in today's lecture is that Abraham Lincoln is evolving. Okay? He was not the great emancipator. He was not the man that was held up in January 1865 as, as, as Father Abraham. Right? In 1854, he still doesn't he, he cares about slavery, but it's not, it's, not the, uh, the, it's not the wedge that is dividing the nation in his mind yet. And by 1860, he would save slavery if he could, if it meant keeping the union together. So I just want to caveat that this is more of a snapshot look at emancipation in Alabama. And that, and that it, you know, I, and I tried to let the actors speak for themselves. So I'm, I'm quoting more than I would in a regular academic paper. On February 21st, 1818, the Nashville Whig and Tennessee Advertiser republished an article written by an unnamed Virginian who had toured the western frontier along the Alabama Territory. The writer had visited Madison County and came away, came away impressed with the region's healthy environment, fertile land, and pleasant weather. He encouraged settlers from Virginia to venture westward, but warned readers that his only objection to Madison is, quote, the number of slaves and the evils that arise from slavery. Although the introduction, sorry, I'm going to move my slides here too. The, the, um, although the introduction of slavery had predated Alabama statehood by two centuries, this relatively new territory and soon-to-be state had already become a haven for slave owners as thousands of white settlers succumbed to Alabama fever during the early part of the 19th century. Bountiful land in northern Alabama and the Tennessee River Valley, as well as the state's Black Belt region, attracted planters, merchants, professionals, and industrialists who looked to partake of the American dream. Slave labor became an essential part of this white-only dream, however, and gangs of slaves beat back the old southwest frontier and transformed undeveloped land into productive cotton fields. Slavery had found a home in Alabama. By the time Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States in, July, in November 1860, slavery had become a lucrative business in Alabama, and most white Southerners, I'm sorry, had become a lucrative business in Alabama, and most white residents in the state either directly or indirectly benefited from slave labor. Federal census records show that 33,730 white Alabamians owned 435,080 slaves. 45% of all Alabamians lived in bondage by the time of the Civil War. Many slave owners lived on modest-sized plantations and farms and often worked alongside their slaves. In 1860, almost 43% of slave, slaveholders owned less than four slaves, while almost 40% of slaveholders owned between five and 19 slaves. 13% owned between 20 and 49 slaves, and just 1% of all slaveholders in Alabama owned over 100 slaves. The average price of a prime male, prime male slave had, ridden, had risen from about $700 in 1800 to over $1,500 by 1860. Recent research, recent research shows that this amount, when adjusted for time and inflation, would mean that a prime male slave in 1860 cost approximately $20,000 in today's money. Alabama cotton based, Alabama's cotton-based economy grew simultaneously as slavery developed around the state. In 1820, state planters produced 25,390 bales of cotton. Forty years later, they produced 791,964 bales of cotton for foreign and domestic markets. 
By 1860, the South, if treated as an independent nation, had become the fourth wealthiest nation in the world and the fifth most industrialized. Lincoln's election threatened Southern slave owners who had invested their profits into land, slaves, cotton, and industrial projects, and it also worried Southerners who did not own slaves, but whose lives and livelihoods depended on what slaves produced. Pro-slavery advocates and regional reformers often cited the efficiency of Alabama capitalists who produced higher profit margins by maximizing the potential of slave labor. Yet capitalism proved to be difficult on the soil and people of Alabama as cotton planters and yeoman farmers used up the state's rich resources and then moved on to new land. I'm going to pause here real quickly. You saw the, the, the map with slavery, and this is the map for cotton, obviously. And you can obviously see by the clusters, as they are designated by the, by the dots here of 1820, 1840, and 1860, is that the Black Belt of Alabama and Northern Alabama, the Tennessee River Valley, is clearly uh, uh, standing out in, in, in the, based on the rest of Alabama and even Western Tennessee. Um, and so this is the richest land being used, ma maximized by capitalistic uh, planters who are, who are looking to maximize their, their profits. Overinvestments in slavery, cotton, and land hindered community development and the, and the promotion of cultural and social institutions in Alabama. In a published address to fellow Alabamians in 1855, Clement C. Clay Jr. of Madison County warned that lucrative cotton profits came at a high price for overall state progress. He worried that investments in land and slaves limited the development of community and culture in Alabama. Although he owned slaves and cotton fields himself, Clay warned that his state was becoming a place where, quote, ill fares the land to hasten ills of prey where wealth accumulates and men decay. End quote. Frederick Law Olmsted, a northern travel writer and partisan abolitionist, also noted, noted slavery's negative influence on Alabama's overall development after touring parts of the state in the mid-1850s. Books such as Uncle Tom's Cabin also inflamed, sorry, also inflamed northern resentment against slavery. And rumors swirled that Simon Legree, the fictitious villain in the book, had been patterned after Meredith Calhoun, a planter and slave trader from Huntsville. As the sectional debate over slavery became more intense, men such as C.C. C. Clay Jr. backed away from earlier criticisms of slavery in favor of projecting a solid Southern defense against outside attacks on the, on the South's peculiar institution. In 1859, Clay warned readers against unconstitutional political threats from the Republican Party and that, that might restrict or end slavery. By this time, white Alabamians could ill afford attacks on slavery and were ready to defend their political rights and economic fortunes. Fire eaters such as William Lowndes Yancey further inflamed public feelings by suggesting that white Southerners would themselves become slaves if Abraham Lincoln was elected President of the United States in 1860. As promised by secessionists around the South, Lincoln's presidential victory quickly sparked protests and disunion. On January 11, 1861, the Alabama Secession Convention passed an ordinance of secession and became the fourth state to leave the Union. On March 4, 1861, Abraham Lincoln stood on the steps of the unfinished Capitol building in Washington, D.C. and spoke to a divided nation on the brink of war. He had spent months crafting an inaugural speech that clearly highlighted his unmistakable position on slavery and the preservation of the Union. Lincoln understood that he would be speaking to two nations that day and that both sides would use his words to justify their respective positions. The United States had splintered after his election in early November 1860, and Americans watched as secessionists voted South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas out of the Union. By, 18, by February 1861, representatives from these southern states had appointed a provisional government to guard southern institutions under the leadership of Jefferson Davis. Davis, in an inaugural speech delivered two weeks before Lincoln's, evoked memories of the founding fathers of 1776 and 1789 to explain the creation of the Confederate States of America. Yet he managed to avoid any mention of slavery in his uninspired speech here in Montgomery, Alabama. Lincoln, however, understood that slavery had everything to do with disunion and the current problems that plagued the United States. In his inaugural address, Lincoln promised not to interfere with slavery in areas where it already existed, and he reasserted, he reasserted his desire to preserve the Union at almost any cost. He ended his conciliatory speech 
by evoking the mystic chords of memory that bound all Americans to the better angels of their nature. Lincoln's carefully chosen words did little to quiet Southern protests in newspapers and journals ar around the South, such as Charleston Mercury and DeBose Review. Southern fire eaters and Northern abolitionists had already determined that only war could settle the sectional differences that plagued the Union. Two weeks after Lincoln's speech, Alexander H. Stevens, Vice President of the Confederate States of America, provided the clearest analysis of what slavery meant to the South. On March 21st, 1861, less than a month before Southern forces fired on Fort Sumner in Charleston Bay, South Carolina, Stevens delivered a speech that defended slavery as the cornerstone of Southern society. In his defense of slavery, he pointed out that the United States Constitution and Thomas Jefferson's vision of a new nation had been, had been flawed because, quote, they rested upon the assumption of the equality of races. This is an error. It was a sandy foundation, and the government built upon it when the, and the, and the government built upon it fell when the storm came and the wind blew, end quote. Stevens continued his famous speech by noting that the Confederate States of America rested on a different foundation, one that assumed, quote, the great truth is that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that a slave subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition, end quote. Slavery had caused Southerners to rebel against the revolutionary ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to reformulate a new nation predicated on white supremacy. Their bid, for, their bid for constitutional reform and secession from the United States eventually cost 620,000 Americans their lives. Clay's articles, Yancey's promises, and Lincoln's inauguration address became secondary after Fort Sumner forced Alabamians, like many Americans, to prepare for a war that either, to either save the Union or maintain the Confederacy. Although slavery lurked in the minds of many Americans, the initial excitement of war mobilization captured the collective attention of both sides. Yet early military defeats and inept generals brought the misery of war into stark focus for Northerners. Lincoln also worried because he understood that the Confederacy only had to exist to win the war and remain independent. Additionally, the governments of Great Britain, France, and Russia had also taken note of decisive Confederate victories in 1861 and early 1862. And Lincoln worried that the economic power of King Cotton might force nations to intervene, break the northern naval blockade, and recognize Confederate nationhood. Now working as a commissioner in London, attempted to sway Prime Minister John Russell by reminding him that secession and war had come because of federal abuses of power and that disunion had been a constitutional option for the South. In a private letter to a fellow commissioner, however, Yancey admitted that, quote, public mind here is entirely opposed to the government of the Confederate States of America on the question of slavery, and that the sincerity and universality of this feeling embarrasses the government here in dealing with the question of our recognition, end quote. Lincoln had no way of knowing which way European ministers might sway their governments in public opinion in their respective nations, and he needed to alter the negative course of the war for the North or possibly risk fighting a multinational military force dedicated, dedicated to preserving the supremacy of King Cotton and permanent disunion. As war crept closer to the physical boundaries of Alabama in early 1862, possible federal invasion and occupation became a reality for residents living in the northern part of the state. Up until this time, northern military commanders such as George McClellan and Don Carlos Buell had avoided costly battles and campaigns because they hoped to reunite the north and south without the taint of heavy bloodshed. The Battle of Shiloh changed how many Americans felt about the war, however, and savage fighting and casualty totals that exceeded all American wars combined up until that point made the battle a demarcation line between a soft war of appeasement and a hard war of punishment. Lincoln recognized that ultimate Northern victory meant that Union troops had to invade Southern territory and capture or destroy assets that aided the Confederacy. Although he had been careful not to threaten loyal slave owners who might help the process of reunion, despite signing two confiscation acts that allowed Union troops to seize all property used in support of the rebellion, Lincoln now viewed slave labor as a Southern military and civilian advantage that needed to be destroyed in order to defeat the Confederacy. 
For Alabamians, this new campaign of occupation and punishment began shortly after the Battle of Shiloh, when General Ornsby Mitchell's division of Don Carlos Buell's Army of Ohio captured Huntsville in much of northern Alabama. Despite Huntsville's economic and military importance, Union troops had little trouble capturing and holding the town that the Charleston Mercury had once suggested would make a good capital for the new Confederacy. War had now reached Alabama, and its residents, both black and white, wondered how it would change their lives and livelihoods. Occupation proved to be a bitter learning experience for many of Huntsville's white citizens because General Mitchell wanted to punish slave owners who had brought about disunion and war. He arrested and harassed many city leaders and moved troops into Huntsville's finest homes. Slaves watched as blue uniformed soldiers flooded the region and began to calculate the costs and sacrifices of freedom. Newspaper dispatches reported that Union troops harassed Southern, super, Southern sympathizers, destroyed personal property, and helped slaves escape from their masters. Priscilla Larkin, a young diarist from Jackson County who lived in Huntsville while attending a local female college during the war, commented extensively on slave, on slave behavior after, <coughs> excuse me, slave behavior, I just lost my, uh, commented extensively on slave behavior after federal troops gained control of the city. Her diary captured significant changes in how slaves lived and worked in Huntsville and highlighted how slaves manipulated their situation to gain hints of freedom long before Lincoln's proclamation. On June 15, 1862, Larkin reported that many slaves had run away during the night only to be found in the city under the protection of federal troops. Somewhat surprisingly, General Mitchell asked loyal slave owners to retrieve their slaves, but this policy would soon change as war measures against slavery hardened. Larkin also noted that Union commanders in the city had attempted to force slaves into work gangs, remarking somewhat maternally, quote, oh, how I felt for some of the Negroes. If they were condemned to be hung, they would not have looked worse, end quote. She also felt surprise and shock when on August 4th, 1862, one of her slaves picked up, all of her slaves picked up and left to go find her family. On August 13th, Larkin resigned herself to the reality of self-emancipation when she confirmed in her diary, quote, that all my Negroes had gone to the Yanks, end quote. Two days later, she reported that Kate, her personal slave, had returned home safely. Larkin now recognized, however, that her relationship with Kate had changed and that her personal asset could quickly become a liability, admitting that, quote, I expect I have divulged too many of my secrets to Kate. I feel conscientious about it. Fear she might betray me, though confiding in anyone is running a great risk, end quote. Although formal emancipation was still a distant thought in Kate's mind, her relationship with her mistress had changed to reflect new options and opportunities, despite not being free. The presence of Union troops emboldened many of Huntsville's slaves to think about a future beyond slavery. On September 22, 1862, five days after General George McClellan stopped Robert E. Lee's invasion of Maryland at the Battle of Antietam, Abraham Lincoln unveiled his new plan to end slavery in the rebellious states of the Confederacy. He had crafted his plan in July 1862, but upon the advice of Secretary of State William H. Seward, waited for a significant military victory to make his announcement. That moment occurred after Union troops repelled Confederate soldiers from the banks of Antietam Creek in Washington County, Maryland, on what turned out to be the single bloodiest day of the Civil War. Although Lincoln's proclamation only freed slaves in rebellious states that he had no control over, and somewhat hypocritically did not free slaves in the federally controlled border states of Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, his act changed the tenor of the war by emphasizing the abolition of slavery as well as the reunion of the North and South. Friends and foes quickly took notice of this policy shift, and Mr. Lincoln's war to save the Union now became a war to free four million slaves. <clears throat> Excuse me. News of Lincoln's initial proclamation traveled slowly through formal and informal networks throughout the South. Misinformation and rumor became a maddening part of life as Southern newspapers disappeared because of the scarcity of paper and ink or because of federal armies that disrupted telegraph and railroad lines. Although the preliminary proclamation was released on September 22, 1862, news of Lincoln's order did not reach Richmond, Virginia, which is only 125 miles away, until September 25th, and Charleston, South Carolina, until September 29th. A few weeks later in Mobile, 
<coughs> excuse me, Lewis Hughes's master attempted to hide the news from his slaves, but Hughes quickly learned of the proclamation through slave gossip between plantations and proudly noted, quote, we knew it was our right to be free, and we began to formulate plans to, to gain our independence. Although it would take weeks for the news to reach more remote areas of the Confederacy, Southerners predictably attacked Lincoln and his proclamation. The Daily Dispatch in Richmond viewed the move as a desperate one and believed that, quote, instead of strengthening the Lincoln cause in England, this abolition proclamation of his will intensify the hatred and disgust which are already entertained through, toward this monster through the whole realm of civilization, end quote. Southern commentators wrote scathing articles that called for, harsher war, for a harsher war in which individual states would prosecute Union prisoners of war as slave insurrectionists. Confederate Congressman Thomas Jenkins Sims of Louisiana warned that Lincoln's war measure was, quote, a gro gross violation of the usages of civilized warfare, an outrage on the, on the rights of private property, and an invitation to an atrocious, servile war, end quote. One slave recalled walking with her father and seeing a bullet-ridden effigy of Lincoln hanging from a tree. Lincoln's proclamation even changed how Americans spoke and thought about the war. He expanded the northern lexicon to include emancipation as well as union when discussing northern war goals. Now, this is an informal survey, but I use a, a website that's put out by the National Endowment for the Humanities. They have six million scanned newspaper pages, and I put in a key word for every year of the Civil War, I put in two key words. I put in union and emancipation, so I kind of want to caveat that. Newspaper writers and editors, editors use the word union 17,859 times in 1861, but only 12,825 times in 1865, despite the fact that union had just became a reality for a once divided nation. The word emancipation <clears throat> jumped from 421 mentions in 1861 to almost 1,200 times in 1863. Despite the extreme vitriol of Southerners and stout objections from many Democrats in the North, Lincoln pushed his plan forward, and on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation ushered in a new birth of freedom for millions of slaves and new concerns for thousands of white slave masters in Alabama and around the South. Freedom did not just occur for slaves living in Alabama because Lincoln proclaimed it so on January 1st, 1863. His proclamation provided legal support, and Union troops offered some protection, but ultimately it was up to individual slaves to free him or herself. Others decided to remain with their masters for the duration of the war as the safest alternative. Matilda Pugh Daniel, who belonged to United States Senator James L. Pugh before the war, remained with her master after the war, despite being offered land to farm and a new life away from him. Another Alabama slave recalled Quote, when freedom come, I remember that master told us we was free, but that, that we could stay on if we liked. Most of us stayed with him for a spell and then left. Others, because of geographic location and the lack of federal troops nearby, waited and bided their time. Gus Askew, a slave from Eufaula, remembered when General Benjamin Garrison's cavalry troopers rode through the town in 1865 and recalled, quote, Mr. Lincoln Dunn said we was free, but us little niggers were too scared to listen to any of that music, even if the soldiers had come to set us free, end quote. But overwhelmingly, for many slaves, Lincoln became an ally that helped them achieve freedom. <clears throat> An ex-slave who settled in Alabama after the war remembered her days in bondage as being tolerable, but emphasized, quote, I'd rather be free now. I never seed Mr. Lincoln, but when they told me about him, I thought he was partly God, end quote. Ex-slave Charlie Ahrens remembers, quote, remembered, quote, there was a time for slavery. People had to be punished for their sin. There was a time for it not to be, and the Lord has opened a good view to Mr. Lincoln and he promoted a good idea, end quote. In January 1865, Daniel Pettus escaped from his master in Huntsville claiming, quote, under the proclamation of the President of the United States, I consider myself a free man, end quote. Yet every slave did not attribute, I'm sorry, yet every slave did not attribute freedom to an abstract document written in faraway Washington, D.C., as highlighted by one ex-slave who claimed, quote, I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln except they say he set us free, and I don't know nothing about that either, end quote. 
Emanci emancipation would be an ongoing process that took time and effort and that required cooperation among the federal government, Union soldiers, and black slaves. Freedom came slowly to Alabama. The, possibil the possible reality of impending freedom created by the Emancipation Proclamation became a disruptive force throughout the South. Catherine M. Catherine M. Fennell of Gunnersville supported secession and war enough to write a poem in early 1861 that included the lines, quote, ye men of Alabama, awake, 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 and render the coil sonder of this abolition snake, end quote. After the capture of Huntsville, she gleefully noted in her diary that Union soldiers had been caught uh, abusing runaway slaves and returning them home or shooting them on, on sight. Later in, later in the war, Fennel's tone soured when slaves began to run away and failed to return home. She blamed the proclamation for influencing her slaves and even acknowledged that they were free in her mind now, but she did not kick them off her property. Fennel's slave foreman offered to stay with her because he admitted that he had no other option at the time better than living with her. But that changed the next day when two white men came down the Tennessee River on a boat and offered to take him away. Mary Jane Chaddock of Huntsville likewise found life more difficult without the security of knowing when her slaves might leave or when they might work. On November 16, 1863, she wrote that Union officers had, had, I'm sorry, she wrote that Union officers asked all healthy black men to go to Nashville to defend the city. A day later, she complained, quote, an abolition preacher from Ohio made a speech to the darkies, which has caused a great deal of excitement among them. Many of them have left today, and two or three families in town are already without servants, end quote. A few days later, the same preacher, remind, a few days later, the same preacher reminded Huntsville slaves that Lincoln had already set them free almost a year before, and that it was the duty of every black man, woman, and child to help destroy the Confederacy. Outright, outraged by this talk, Chaddock claimed that, quote, he has opened up the way for them to come here and set them free, and when, they are, and when we are subjugated, they, the blacks, are to, are to uh, occupy the, the country, end quote. A year later, James T. Ayers, a Methodist preacher serving in the Union Army, rode through much of northern Alabama telling slaves that Father Abraham had already freed them and that they needed to fight in the army. Ayers' successful recruiting trip stri stripped Huntsville of its black laborers, many of which were being used by the Union Army, forcing General William T. Sherman to issue an order halting the practice, or the, halting the practice of recruitment or risk manpower shortages, shortages in occupied Alabama. The Emancipation Proclamation allow allowed ex-slaves from Alabama to exercise their newfound freedom to fight the power that once held them in bondage. Recruiting stations in and Bridgeport, Alabama, Pulaski, Tennessee, and Corinth, Mississippi mustered thousands of black soldiers into newly established regiments of the United States Colored Troops. Modern, his, modern historians attribute six African-American regiments to Alabama with 4,969 black recruits, or 6% of the state's total black population between the ages of 18 and 45, having joined the Union Army. Separated from white soldiers, but led by white officers, these black regiments primarily guarded strategic bridges and railroad lines or served as garrison troops throughout the South. They also helped build, build needed fortifications, trenches, and graves. Although white commanders were initially hesitant to use black regiments in battle, the bravery and fighting spirit of African-American regiments at Fort Wagner, South Carolina, and Milkins Bend, Louisiana, changed popular misconceptions about how ex-slaves would do in battle. And real quickly, I want to take a moment. 6% of able-bodied black soldiers, or blacks in the state of Alabama may seem very low. Part of the problem was is that Alabama remained pretty much unoccupied comparatively to the rest of the South. And so for many black slaves or ex-slaves living in Alabama, there just wasn't Union troops near enough to, to feel comfortable uh, joining up the army or escaping. So I just want to point that out. And this map kind of shows that. The, the darkest, the darkest uh, hatching on the, on the map here is where uh, uh, this, the South still existed, the Confederacy still existed in 1865. So you can see kind of the layers of occupation uh, based on, on year with, with this. So this is the, sh the shrinking South. Confederate soldiers found the presence of black soldiers difficult, and fighting around Athens, Alabama, and later Fort Pillow, Tennessee, became more savage as uniformed ex-slaves realized that Southern troops would either kill or return them to slavery if given the chance. 
Ultimately, 179,000 black men served in the United States Army and helped defeat the Confederacy and to end slavery. Interestingly, Lincoln's leadership and bet I'm sorry, interesting Lincoln's leadership and better Northern commanders after 1864 forced the Confederate States of America to consider slave emancipation as a reward for slaves willing to fight for the South too. Popular Confederate General Patrick R. Claiborne wrote an open letter to Jefferson Davis on January 2nd, 1864, calling for black slaves to fight for the South uh, calling for black slaves to fight for the South and reminding Davis that, quote, this measure will deprive the North of the moral and material aid which it now derives from the bitter prejudices with which foreigners view the institution, end quote. Davis quashed all mention of this letter and the suggestion of black Confederates temporarily damaged Claiborne's military career. A little over a year later, however, desperate times for the Confederacy forced none other than Robert E. Lee to make a similar suggestion and on March 13, 1865, Jefferson Davis signed a law that allowed slaves to be freed to serve as soldiers in the Confederate Army. That white men had been bled so dry over the, over the, over the last four years that they saw that, that this might be a possibility, despite not wanting to emancipate slaves, obviously. Yet, Lee, yet Lee's army never saw black troops join them because he surrendered his Army of Northern Virginia a month later on April 9, 1865. It would be on this day that Lincoln would finally see glimmers of reunion reemerge and new freedoms emerge after years of fighting. Although Lincoln would never see racial peace and true reunion in his lifetime, his original goal of union and his evolving goal of emancipation managed to guide a nation through four through through the to guide a nation through the four bloodiest years of its existence. At the end of the war, many ex-slaves living in Alabama worried about their status as defeated Confederate soldiers returned home and news of Lincoln's assassination filtered southward. Lincoln's proclamation had been a War Powers Act, and congressional debates over a constitutional amendment to abolish slavery had become highly politicized and contentious in 1865. Eventually, however, as much of the nation grieved their fallen president, enough states voted to ratify the 13th Amendment and forever end slavery in the United States on December 6, 1865. Yet many white Alabamians, bitter about military defeat and the loss of racial superiority, had already begun to search for a social, political, cultural, and economic system that would simply be slavery by another name. And this is a famous uh, drawing that was published, or, or a piece of artwork that was published in a uh, Tuscaloosa newspaper, obviously after the war. Um, so uh, we, 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 we all probably know what slavery by another name is, and that it would be Jim Crow and um, uh, all that followed after the war. Abraham Lincoln helped correct a mistake forged by the founding fathers of the United States, who dared to use the words liberty, freedom, and equality as hundreds of thousands of Americans remained in chains and only counted as three-fifths of a person. Although the Emancipation Proclamation helped correct these previous wrongs, he used a dreary November day in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to speak to all Americans, North and South, loyal and rebellious, and white and black. The Gettysburg Address did not lay blame or smear enemies. It did not even speak of union or emancipation. It reminded Americans that a new nation was emerging from the sacrifice and loss of both sides and that a new America, one better than, had, one better than the one that had been created four score and seven years before, would grow from the unfinished work at Gettysburg and other battlefields around the South. Lincoln promised that every person, both black and white, who gave their last full measure of devotion to end slavery and reunite a broken nation would be remembered for their sacrifice and commitment to cultivating a new birth of freedom, one guarded by a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and one nation that has yet to perish from this earth. Thank you. I know we have, we have uh, time for questions. I know I, I tried to uh, keep it in uh, the realm of lunch for you, so hopefully I did that. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and we will be sure that you 
have the microphone so that you can speak directly into the microphone. Do you think that uh, Lincoln's motive was uh, strategic? The, the Emancipation Proclamation, you're saying? Do you think that Lincoln's motivations were strategic? Yes. To help win the war? Yes, absolutely. And then, you know, it's, it's in uh, December 1862, he makes a comment about if it, if it means to, to free all the slaves to win the war, I'll do it. If it means to keep them all enslaved, I'll do it. I'll do whatever it takes. And so, in reality, yeah, what you see is you see a shifting in, in, in strategy and tactics that slaves are actually benefiting the Confederacy up until Yes. No, it is not. Uh, I looked for a picture of Larkin. I couldn't find it. Um, so I had to uh, resort to the next best thing, which was finding just a family with a, with a slave in it. So the, the slave family in question, if I can find it here for you, um, is actually, uh, it was a, uh, oops, sorry. Other way? All right, that's one second here. Okay, right there. Um, no, this is a picture from the mid 1850s uh, in, I believe it was in South Carolina. Um, but it gives you a good idea of, of, of just kind of the idea of having a family portrait with someone like Kate, uh, who was the personal slave of, of um, Larkin's. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at Larkin's diary, you know, she's, you can tell she is personally stunned and hurt by the loss of Kate. When she leaves, her, her diary is, is very expressive. And it's interesting, when Kate comes back, um, Kate immediately makes her start playing the piano again. And she kind of becomes a taskmaster. And it's kind of interesting to, to read the diary, because, uh, because Priscilla is reporting what Kate's making her do. Uh, it's not what you would think in, in this case. But she's, I think she's worried enough about Kate being a liability that she wants to keep Kate happy. John, do you think that uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and the, given the timing of it prolonged the war? A lot of Lincoln's critics. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, you know, that's that's a hard, that, you know, it's it's a hard one to answer because obviously I don't know. I mean, there's the the other answer would be counterfactual. Um, I don't know. I don't know if any, if I don't have any of you have a, a stronger opinion about it. I do. I, I would think, for me personally after having read as much as I've read, I would say that it may have lengthened the war in the sense of it made Confederates more resolute, but at the same time, it really did remove a, a strategic advantage that suddenly you had a magnet that you could pull uh, you know, potential laborers who could help Southern troops dig fortifications. It allowed white soldiers to fight and not necessarily have to dig trenches or, or, or guard railroad lines or anything like that. And so, um, you know, it could go, I, who knows? There's one in the middle. Just a moment. <laughs> uh, I know the Emancipation Proclamation freed slaves in the areas that were still in rebellion against the United States, but I'm curious about areas like New Orleans that were uh, under Union occupation. That's a very good question. In fact, when you read the Emancipation Proclamation, there are, there are exceptions uh, written into the proclamation. And there, I think there's 18 parishes in Louisiana that are written into it because they're occupied. Uh, same for parts of Tennessee and Virginia. So yeah, you know, and I, again, not making this an encompassing uh, uh, paper on emancipation as much as just the wartime experience in Alabama, I think it, it's important to realize that federal occupation, and you remember the one slide where I, I showed you the shrinking, the shrinking South, uh, say that five times, um, 
let me, let me find my map here, okay, is that when you, if you look at this map, okay, areas lost in 1862, okay, are the sideways uh, hash marks here. And if you begin to look at where the, the that, um, where you begin to look and see where troops are beginning to occupy the South, it really is amazing to see that the most critical areas of the South are lost almost immediately. In fact, Earl Hess, a historian uh, who has just written a book about the, the, the West and the Civil War, a great book, a good recommendation if you're looking for something to read this summer, uh, talks about just how easily things fall in the West and how critical this becomes for the rest of the Confederacy. The Confederacy is, al the Confederacy is almost cut in half by the end of 1862. It's completely cut, out, cut, cut in half by July 1863, and you've lost the second biggest port in, in what was the United States, New Orleans, uh, almost immediately. You've lost uh, a, a number of ports along the coast of, of the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean, and it really is amazing um, how fast occupation occurs. And in fact, one of the first areas where you're going to see emancipation really come into effect is a place called Port Royal, where Union troops are going to experiment with redistributing land to slaves freeing them and letting them work the land that they once worked as owners, okay, not as slaves. And this is going to scare a whole lot of people, both north and south. Um, there's, there's some implications that, that of land dis distribution that, that scare a lot of people. Um, first, let me say thank you very much for coming out to speak to us. I've really enjoyed your Well, thank you. Sure. Um, I had a quick question about Reconstruction. Okay. In terms of Reconstruction in Alabama, how prominent were um, freed slaves in the government, like in Alabama? They become they would become more president they would become more prevalent um, after uh, presidential Reconstruction. Um, becomes congressional or radical reconstruction. And so you are going to see in many southern states, you're going to see, and for those of you that are students and you go back and look at your history books or if you go back and look at timelines and suddenly you see a bunch of African American politicians rise up in the, in the middle of the, or the latter half of the 19th century realizing, realize that you're looking at radical reconstruction, that you're looking at the insertion of African Americans into the political system, right? And so what I don't talk about in this because again, I want to focus on one aspect of the, the more personal experience, is that the Civil War really is going to provide, you know, it's going to not only provide the, the abolition of slavery, but it's going to provide citizenship and suffrage to black people that at, at, by 1865, or up to 1865, didn't have any of those rights. And so you really don't become a citizen until you have the right to vote. And so when you see what you see, when, if any of you go back and read your history and, and, and Reconstruction, you just, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to see sometimes, some of these districts where you see African Americans voting and then suddenly as the Ku Klux Klan and as other groups begin to crack down on blacks voting, it's just, it's heartbreaking to see how things change and how things could you know, And Chris asked a question about what if. You know, the question that most people ask is what if Abraham Lincoln wasn't killed in April 1865? What if Abraham Lincoln Again, no malice toward none, all right? A southerner by birth. He was born in Kentucky. He lived 100 miles, he was born 100 miles away from Jefferson Davis, all right? He took two trips to New Orleans, all right? He was southern, his, his, great, his, his great grandparents came from Virginia with Daniel Boone. Uh, this, was a, this was a southern man who understood southern culture. And so who knows what would have happened if, if Lincoln had survived? Um, it's kind of another great what if question. Well, you know, it's funny you should say that. Yes and no. The public did not have access to the Larkin Diary until about a week ago when I asked for it to be scanned. And when I asked for it to be scanned, the Huntsville Public Library said they would put it up on, on their website. Um, and so Priscilla Larkin uh, is the, the name of the diarist. And, um, and again, uh, it, was just sitting in an, it was just sitting in an envelope, and I looked at it, and I asked, you know, who knew about this? And they said, well, no one really. So I felt like I had a gem. So hopefully it'll be up within a couple weeks. Talking about the slavery, and you're talking about most of us always think about agriculture. Mm -hmm. Were there any, uh, was there, I know there was some, but was there much other use of slavery before, uh, before the Civil War? Uh, particularly, did the states 
or other government entities own slaves to do public work like roads and bridges? The, that's a good question. The, uh, the state would often lease or rent slaves from, from masters. Uh, it was a lucrative way of, uh, it was a nice way of making some extra money for the slave, slave masters, uh, especially during times that were down times uh, in the fields or on the plantation. Uh, so yes, slaves were in fact used quite often. Railroad development, railroad construction, uh, toll, uh, toll roads, uh, canals, um, all these things were, were um, primarily done by slave labor under the, uh, th these would be state projects that would be using slave labor. We have time for one more question. Right here. How many blacks fought in the South? That's kind of an overall question. How many blacks fought, how many, how many ex-slaves or slaves fought for the Confederacy? Well, this is an interesting question. Uh, if you ask me personally, zero. Why would you fight for your own bondage? Were there camp followers? Were there people who picked up a gun and shot? Were there people who wore gray uniforms? Were there people, were there ex-slaves who, who loved their masters, who loved their families, who fought for the Confederacy? I'm sure there is. The only problem I have with people who, who want to keep bringing up black Confederates is, where are the muster rolls? Where are, where are the newspaper articles that talk about black units? And the, the last kind of little bit of information that I usually throw out there when people ask me about this is, why would Patrick Claiborne, why would Robert E. Lee feel the need to say we need black Confederates if there were already black Confederates? And so it's, it seems to me that, that they would know best if there were people in their armies that were black. And if they're saying we need black people to supplement our white soldiers that are dying at a pretty high rate, um, it just seems like, you know, yes, there are black soldiers who fight for the Confederacy, but not in the way that we would think, um, that we think. Now, one caveat is when Jefferson Davis signs the, the, the to allow black soldiers into the conf Confederate Army, there are a number of black companies that are raised and actually drill in Richmond, but they, they're never given weapons and they never make it to the field. So technically, yes. And there was actually a, a couple, there's actually a couple units in, in New Orleans too. But other than that, um, you know, this is usually a hot button topic for, for some people. So, so. oh well. <laughs> I have the microphone, they don't. So. <laughs> Dr. Kabach will be here for a few minutes if you have questions for him. Thank you for coming out today and thank you, Dr. Kabach. Thank you very much.